I'm pleased to be convening the fourth meeting of this session between the Conveners Group and the First Minister, and I'd like to welcome the First Minister to the meeting today, and also the teachers and pupils from Creef High School, and also everyone else who's come along to watch the session today. This session gives conveners the opportunity to question the First Minister about the programme for government from the perspective of the Parliament's committees. Now, we need to finish by around 1.55, as Chamber business starts at 2, and we can't overlap. This means time is very tight, how often do I say that? And therefore I will allow around five minutes for each convener and the First Minister exchange. If we have time at the end, and I think we may have this time, I'll allow some further questions so you can just bid for them at the end. And First Minister, do you wish to make any opening statement? No, I'm happy to get straight into the questions. You see, take it from the First Minister, there's brevity for you. Right, I first call James Dornan, who's Convener of Local Government and Communities. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you, Convener, and welcome First Minister. Prior to becoming the Convener of, of the Local Government uh, the Committee, the, there was previous discussion at the, uh, the Committee about Brexit impact on local authorities. And I wonder, uh, given your recent address to the COSLA's annual conference, you stated the Scottish Government are undertaking a significant programme of contention contingency planning in response to Brexit uh, and noting local government's essential and critical role in preparing for our departure from that. What ways could, could you set out for us, what way the Scottish Government support local government's effort for this and how do you see that approach between government councils putting us in a better footing for the disaster that's coming in with Brexit? Well, the Scottish Government is doing a considerable amount of uh, contingency planning. Um, it's not easy. We're doing that largely in the dark at the moment because we don't know any of us the way in which the UK will leave the EU or the basis on which uh, it will do so. Uh, so we're working with a range of different stakeholders and partners, the business community, uh, other organisations and, uh, relevant to your question, local authorities. I think one of the first things to say is that each local authority has its own responsibility to do its preparation and contingency planning and I know uh, that many of them, all of them I would uh, expect are doing that but COSLA has also been working uh, with local authorities and the Scottish Government has been working with both COSLA and individual local authorities. So some of the practical steps we've taken, uh, there's an officials group uh, that has been established uh, between the Scottish Government and COSLA which is looking at operational preparedness and that group is meeting monthly. Uh, we've also seconded a member of Scottish Government staff to COSLA to help uh, them coordinate the Brexit preparedness. Uh, Mike Russell uh, has met, uh, he met earlier in the summer with the President of COSLA and will do so again next month and that relationship is important in terms of overseeing that work. Um, and as I say, uh, COSLA is working with individual local authorities. Members, uh, conveners will have seen the Fraser of Allender uh, work that was done for Glasgow City Council and presented uh, earlier this month showing the impact just in the City of Glasgow. The City of Edinburgh Council developed a, a survey to look at sectoral workforce issues arising from Brexit and I know the results of that are due to be published soon. So we're doing all of that. That gives you a, a sense of the, the practical steps we're taking and we'll continue to do that. I think two final quick points I would make. Uh, one I alluded to at the start, we are doing all of this work really in the dark with our hands tied behind our backs. We don't yet know five months before the due date for exit what the basis of the future relationship will be or even what some of the uh, withdrawal issues are, whether there will be a deal at all or whether we will be in a no deal scenario. Uh, and the second and final point is while we will continue to do everything we can to mitigate as far as we can, I think it's also important that we're very frank and honest uh, with people, that we're not going to be able to take away all of the impacts of Brexit, particularly if we find ourselves in a no-deal scenario. So helping organisations and businesses to prepare for those impacts that can't be mitigated will also be an important part of the process of work. Okay, can I... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when the, the, this was discussed at our committee, one of the parts that came out as being most affected was the potential the workforce for local authorities. Is there any work being done on that specifically or do you, do you have anything in plans that you could share with us? First Minister. So it's been a particular focus of uh, the Scottish Government to look not just in terms of uh, local authorities but across the economy where the impacts of uh, labour and skill shortages are likely to fall. The work that I mentioned, uh, the Edinburgh City Council uh, has done, that's been specifically focused on uh, workforce issues across uh, different sectors. So we 
uh, have had and will continue to have uh, discussions and look at where we can do focus work uh, with different sectors that are likely to be disproportionately hit. We know agriculture, for example, the hospitality sector are two in particular that will feel the brunt of this uh, particularly uh, hard. Not just the private sector, of course, the uh, public sector, the NHS, social care, um, universities, uh, some of those areas are already starting to feel the brunt and some of the anecdotal evidence suggests that that is already beginning to hit. So uh, we're working uh, closely with different interests uh, and looking as we have more information and uh, more certainty around all of this at the plans that we will be able to put in place to mitigate as best we can. Obviously, Skills Development Scotland has got a key role to play in this going forward as well in, in terms of looking at some of the skills needs across the economy. Uh, thank you. Uh, Joan McAlpin, Convener of Culture, Tourism, European and External Affairs, please. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, you referred to um, the possibility of a no-deal no Brexit, which is obviously something that we're all not, not wanting to happen. But should agreement be reached on a withdrawal agreement, the UK government will be required to introduce the withdrawal agreement bill at Westminster and that will also engage the legislative consent process here. What discussions has your government had with regard to the potential content of the bill and the time which will be available uh, for scrutiny of this bill by the Scottish Parliament? First Minister. Okay, let me try and uh, take the, the different elements of that question in turn. Before I go on to uh, answer the question uh, which is based on the assumption there will be a deal, um, let me just say a little bit more about my concern that we are now heading for a no-deal scenario, um, almost with every day that passes right now, instead of the UK government opening up negotiating space that increases the possibility of reaching a deal that then can uh, attract political support. They seem to be closing down that negotiating space and digging themselves deeper into the hole that they've got themselves in. And uh, I am increasingly concerned, literally with every day that passes right now, that the prospect of a no deal is becoming ever greater. And as things stand just now, and we're in a fast moving, well, often not a very fast moving situation, we're in a fluid situation, but as things stand just now, um, I think no deal may actually be the most likely outcome. And that is deeply concerning. And given that we are two and a half years on from the vote, five months away from exit, it is staggering incompetence that a government has allowed the situation to get into this stage. And I think Brexit is frankly shaping up to be the biggest failure of uh, government policy and uh, handling of a situation that any of us have seen perhaps in our entire lifetimes. Um, but your question is predicated on there being a deal and let's, uh, let's all hope that, that that will be the case. If there uh, is agreement, then you're absolutely right. Uh, there will then require to be a withdrawal agreement bill introduced in the House of Commons. Uh, that bill will require the legislative consent of the Scottish Parliament. Um, in short, it will substantially amend the EU Withdrawal Act, uh, which of course this Parliament didn't give consent to, but uh, that view was ignored. Uh, the bill would postpone almost all of the Withdrawal Act so that it takes uh, place at the end of the implementation period. Uh, we've had preliminary discussions with the UK government about the content of the bill, and I, I will be frank, the engagement around that has so far been better than the engagement we had in the run-up to the withdrawal bill, although that wouldn't be hard because the engagement there was uh, pretty uh, abysmal. Uh, finally, in terms of timing, um, this really uh, does depend, I guess, on when the, the date of exit would be at the moment. Uh, the assumption is that is the 29th of March. Uh, the bill has to be brought forward in a time scale that allows it to be enacted in good time before that. Time is running out for that. And uh, if time is running out for the House of Commons, then clearly it's running out even uh, faster for this parliament. My view is that we're getting into territory where the extension of Article 50 couldn't uh, and shouldn't be ruled out. And if that was to happen, then clearly the, the timing of the bill uh, may slip as well. Uh, the most recent meeting of the GMC on European negotiations discussed uh, the bill and uh, the key point that, or one of the key points that Mike Russell made at that meeting was that it is absolutely essential that there's time for proper scrutiny in this parliament. And we'll keep your committee and others updated as we've got more information. Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much. Uh, as, as you say, there's, there's a great many ifs um, around this whole process, but if um, such a process was to go ahead and there was a withdrawal agreement bill, 
Uh, would you be planning to publish a legislative consent memorandum? And indeed, would you be planning to recommend? Could you see yourself recommending legislative consent in any circumstances? First Minister. Well, as briefly as I can, the, the standing orders of Parliament uh, require us to lodge a legislative consent memorandum uh, for every bill that uh, affects devolved matters. Uh, and we would expect the withdrawal agreement bill, if it comes forward, to be such a bill. So I would expect we will lodge a memorandum. Um, and the memorandum explains the aspects of the bill that requires the Parliament's concern. Uh, but the memorandum would then set out uh, whether or not the government intended to bring forward a legislative consent motion, which we would do if our intention was to ask the parliament to give consent. Uh, as we've made publicly clear, as things stand at the moment, it is not the Scottish government's intention to recommend consent to any le uh, Brexit-related legislation that impinges on devolved matters, because you know, we think what happened over the Withdrawal uh, Act was completely unacceptable, where the consent of this parliament was ignored. Um, and if that's going to be uh, the approach the UK government takes, then what is the point of this parliament looking and deciding whether or not it, it wants to bring uh, forward consent? So we've... Uh, requested of the UK Government a, a fundamental look at how the Sewell provisions and the legislative consent provisions are operating, and I think that is required before we would feel able to ask the Parliament to give consent in the knowledge that that consent may well, uh, or, or refusal of that consent may well be ignored. Thank you. Graham Simpson, convener of Delegated Powers and Law Reform. Mr Simpson, please. Thanks very much. Um, uh, as you know, there's a, an inter-parliamentary forum on uh, Brexit, which conveners of committees here, the UK Parliament and the Welsh Assembly attend. I represent the uh, DPLR committee there. Uh, the next meeting is in Cardiff tomorrow. Um, we've previously discussed how intergovernmental intergovernmental relations could work after Brexit. There's been a clear view at the forum that the joint ministerial committee mechanism is not fit for purpose. I understand you agree with that and that a review of JMC structures is happening. I wonder if you could say what your misgivings are and how you think committees here, uh, not just my own, could feed into uh, that review uh, and come up with something that is fit for purpose? First Minister. Well, uh, you, you kind of uh, pre-empted my, my first remark, which is I don't think the current mechanisms are fit for purpose. Um, I uh, had come to that conclusion uh, through past experience before we got to the Brexit discussions, but the experience of trying to go through a process of making the Scottish Government's voice heard in Brexit has confirmed my view that the, the mechanisms as they work at the moment are simply not fit for purpose. Now, what I would say is that, in my view, that's not necessarily down to the theory of how uh, these mechanisms are supposed to work. It's not down to you know, failures in how the memorandum of understanding is drafted. It's about the practice. Um, it's about the lack of political will to make uh, these work and to treat these mechanisms seriously and in good faith. And it's also one of, just to, to give a more specific answer to your question, one of the serious flaws. And I think, uh, well, I obviously can't put words in his mouth, I think the First Minister of Wales would agree with this. One of the serious flaws in how the mechanisms work just now is that there is no way of ensuring compliance with how the intergovernmental machinery is supposed to work. So it can be flouted and there's no consequences for that. And where that takes is if you don't have political will across all parties to make it work voluntarily, there's nothing that can enforce compliance. So if, uh, and as you rightly say, there is a review of this underway just now, and in my view, that's one of the issues that's got to be seriously looked at. Uh, the UK government all, often, not always, but often talks a good game around this, but doesn't deliver in practice and if we as a Scottish Government were to treat some of our stakeholders and partners uh, in such a dismissive way when it comes to consultation as the UK Government treats devolved administrations we would rightly be roundly criticised for it. Graham Simpson. The, the, the second part of the question was about how uh, committees here could feed into that review. For uh, committees to make their views known. I mean, th this is a, a review that's been taken forward uh, through the GMC uh, mechanisms. That's certainly something I'm happy through the Scottish Government offices uh, to, to feed into the conduct of that review to ask for a specific route in which committees that had an interest in that could feed in their views. 
Uh, my view is, is that would be helpful, and, and I think that is the kind of thing that we should be encouraging committees to do. Often, I, I obviously come at this very much from the perspective of uh, the Scottish Government's role in how these uh, inter-relationships uh, work, but as you rightly say, there is a, a key role for parliaments here as well. And, and I think, just final point on this, I think it would be useful uh, almost for that to happen in reverse as well, for, for the intergovernmental part of this to maybe look at how the interparliamentary part works and see whether there are lessons that can be learned. I don't know what your view or others' view is on how well that works, but if the view is that works reasonably well, maybe there's things that we can all learn uh, in trying to get something that is working better than is the case just now. Thank you. Ruth McGuire, Convener of Equalities and Human Rights. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you. Good morning, First Minister. Um, Scotland faces a number of significant challenges to human rights protections, and one of those challenges is Brexit. My committee heard from Professor Alan Miller, Chair of your advisory group on human rights leadership, during evidence on our inquiry into human rights and the Scottish Parliament. He told the committee that the closest thing to a constitution in Scotland are the two pillars in the Scotland Act, and these pillars require compliance with EU legislation and the ECHR. He said removal of one pillar, EU compliance, and I'll quote now, imperils our continuing adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights. Professor Miller believed a new framework would be needed post-Brexit. Now, First Minister, I'm not asking you to preempt the um, results of the advisory group, but I'd be interested to hear your views on the needs for the Scottish Government to carry out human rights impact assessments to ensure that human rights and a culture of human rights can be systematically mainstreamed and embedded into law, policy, practices, procedures and priorities of the government. First Minister. Well, I think it's a really important question. As you, as you say, there's uh, key formal mechanisms at the moment that effectively embed a human rights approach. Uh, one of those is uh, the need to make sure that the legislation of the Scottish Parliament abides by ECHR uh, requirements. Obviously, public bodies more generally have to act in a way that's compliant with convention rights, whether that comes through the Human Rights Act uh, route. Brexit is a real risk to this, and it's something I've discussed with uh, Professor Miller on a couple of occasions, uh, more than a couple of occasions. Uh, as you know, I asked him to, to convene the leadership group, which is really been asked to look at three things. Firstly, how we make sure that if uh, Scotland is outside of the European Union at any stage, then uh, we don't uh, fall behind current European human rights protections. Uh, secondly, how we, even if we weren't in the EU, would keep pace with any developments in EU legislation. And thirdly, how we can make sure that whatever our constitutional arrangements, whether we're in or out of the EU, Scotland is a world leader in human rights. And Alan uh, Miller's group is due to report uh, to me by the end of this year. And I'm sure your committee will have a great interest in the recommendations he makes. In terms of human rights assessments, I'm very uh, much of the view we should embed uh, that approach in all of our policy making. Uh, we need to, and I think there's some good examples of how the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament are already doing this. The social security legislation is one where uh, we embed a human rights approach right at the start of policy, the policy making process. Looking ahead, that's going to be really important as we incorporate the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, because the success of these kind of things is not in how many you know, court actions are brought to f enforce compliance. It's about whether we avoid that because we've embedded human rights at the outset. So I'm a huge supporter of that approach and want to see us put human rights right at the centre of everything we do. Ruth McGuire. Thank you for that answer. Um, the committee's work and the Scottish Government's advisory group have been focusing on human rights ambition and leadership. Um, First Minister, do you agree that these assessments shouldn't only focus on impact, but also identify opportunities, um, for example, by giving a more concrete expression to particular human rights standards, implementing a court judgment on human rights, or a recommendation from the UK's Universal Periodic Review, or um, UN treaty bodies or reports from special rapporteurs? First Minister. Uh, in short, I would agree that we sh you know, these are the kind of judgments and measurements that we should be looking at to, to assess whether our approach to human rights is, is changing people's experience of whether it's public services or uh, social and economic rights. And that for me means embedding it right at the start of the, the policy making process. Often we see uh, human rights uh, in terms of people having the right to sort of take 
action when their rights are breached. And that's important. Of course it is. But actually, a proper approach to human rights uh, would be ensuring that everything we do, whether it's legislation or policy, respects human rights from the start so that people don't need to be in that position. And all of the uh, kind of uh, tools that you've talked about there are really important in making sure that we measure properly whether we're living up to that. I, I think Scotland has got a really uh, good uh, story to tell around its work in human rights, but I want uh, to see us remain at a leading edge of this, and I think both the work Professor Miller's group is, is doing and the work your committee is involved in will help make sure that's the case. Thank you. Bruce Crawford, Convener of Finance and Constitution, please. Good Deputy President Officer. Perhaps, first of all, it's a bit inevitable at this stage that we're in a situation where there's more examination of what's going on in intergovernmental relations than probably any other time in political history in the UK. And I'm going to cover some of the similar ground to Graham, although not the same, because it's easy to become despondent in this current atmosphere that we're involved in as far as the Brexit process is concerned. But I'm trying to keep a sunny disposition around it all and be as positive <laughs> as I can. So, first of all, we had a very recently, the Finance and Constitution Committee had a very useful visit to Brussels um, as part of our examination of common frameworks, which I think we all accept will be necessary if indeed we do Brexit. We met with a number of sub states and sub states, uh, Norway, uh, Germany, Switzerland, um, and some German lander. What was very striking, certainly to me and I know to others, was the extent to which in all of these meetings that we had, the default position on intergovernmental relations was the complete opposite of what appears to happen in the United Kingdom. Here we seem to start from the processes, how are we going to resolve disputes? But in the contrast, in Brussels, we heard time after time that the priority is to avoid disputes through collective responsibility built on transparent, inclusive, consultative approach to intergovernment relations starting from an early stage in the process. But that doesn't just involve governments, that involves civic society and stakeholders, etc. Now, clearly, there are different political cultures at play here, um, but I'm interested to know from yourself about how you think we can improve intergovernment relations in the United Kingdom, so that instead of focusing on the dispute resolution, and that's not always our starting point, we can actually look at how we can come to conclusions in a consensus way that will help everyone in the country. First Minister. Well, I think you, you kind of get, in, as Graham Simpson did, get into the kind of nub of what some of the challenges, but also some of the solutions are here as well. Firstly, I would agree with you. I think there are lots of examples across other countries where they have uh, not quite the same model of devolution as we have, but similar uh, models, lots of examples of best practice that we could learn from. But I, I do think this comes down to political will and attitude and approach as much, if not more, than it rests on how all of the policies and memorandums are drafted. As you were speaking there, I was trying to find, you know, if you take, for example, the, the current dispute resolution protocol, which is in the uh, memorandum, memorandum of understanding, it is actually called the Agreement on Dispute Avoidance and Resolution. Uh, so. It says things like, in order to reduce to the minimum the potential for disputes to arise, the parties commit themselves to the principles of good communication and cooperation. So that actually sounds quite like the sort of models you were describing there. So that leads me to think it's not necessarily that the policies as they are written down are flawed, although no doubt there are ways in which they can be improved. It's how they're being applied. Now, I read, readily acknowledge that when politics is involved, that can be difficult. And I, as First Minister of the Scottish Government, we take our share of responsibility for making those political relationships work. And no doubt we have to take our share of responsibility for when those political relationships don't work. I don't shy away from that. But we very often find ourselves in a situation where we're trying uh, to apply these policies, but we're finding a UK government you know, sometimes, probably not deliberately, but because they've got other things to worry about, that is not applying what they should be. So they don't consult, they don't uh, take the time to allow the Scottish Government's views to be heard, and therefore we end up in disputes where if communication and listening and proper meaningful dialogue had been better at the start, could have been avoided. And as I said to uh, Graham earlier on, there's nothing at the moment that insists on compliance. It's all voluntary and when, even when we get into disputes it's very difficult to get a, a, 
a, a system of resolving these disputes that everybody has to abide by. So it really does come down to political will and political relationships, and we've all got to play our part in that. But while we have the, the, the sort of Whitehall culture, which often seems to see, uh, not always, but often seems to see dialogue and engagement with devolved administrations as an irritant and something that, you know, if they have to do at all, it's just a tick box rather than something that's meaningful, we're going to end up in these situations. I mean, if you take the technical notices that have been published recently, and I know there are people in Whitehall who pride themselves on the fact that they've consulted much better with the Scottish Government than they've done previously, but that better consultation in most cases has involved us getting three days notice to give any sort of factual uh, views on factual accuracy. That's not meaningful discussion and dialogue. So we can rewrite all of the policies and no doubt there are times where that's necessary, but unless we have political will and a commitment to building those relationships, regardless of political differences, and a proper respect for devolution, which is completely missing at the moment, then these problems are going to continue. Ms Crawford. Um, uh, when it comes to common frameworks, I'm interested also how, how, how do, we, 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 do we begin to reset that relationship? And yes, some of it will be cultural and how we behave as politicians. But one idea is emerging, um, which came out of the committee this morning, was the idea of a joint secretariat to support the drawing up of common frameworks, agreements with areas, etc., which would be jointly financed by um, the UK government and the devolved institutions as a potential mechanism that could help as a buffer in this process to enable better discussion for common frameworks, which are going to be important things for the future. I just wonder whether or not that's something the Scottish Government might look at and consider. First Minister. Very happy to look at that and, and consider that. It sounds uh, like an interesting idea that we should look at. If, if we look at common frameworks in particular, I mean, it's, I suppose it's a, a, a good case study here of, of why these things don't work the way we all want them to work. Uh, because you've got to start from the premise that the devolved parliament, devolved government, in its areas of responsibility, um, is responsible. Um, and these frameworks, we've always said frameworks in a, a number of areas will be required, but they should be put in place by agreement, not by imposition. And if you start from the premise, as the UK government has done, that no, actually, it will be by imposition uh, if all else fails, then it doesn't get that process off on the right footing. So we've got to start from the right premise if we hope to, to get anywhere. Now, the work on common frameworks is not proceeding as quickly as uh, all of us might have thought that it would because I think a lot of the energy has been diverted into no deal planning. But as we get uh, back into this work, uh, ideas like the one you said, I, I do think have a part to play. So I'll be interested to look in more detail at what the committee has come up with this morning. Uh, thank you. I call Edward Mountain, Convener for Rural Economy and Connectivity. Mr Mountain, please. First Minister, good afternoon. Uh, you will be aware uh, that my family have had a long-term interest in agriculture, which is fully declared in my register of interest. Uh, the committee would be interested to know that post-Brexit, whether you believe that Scotland will need a bespoke agricultural bill to promote a progressive agricultural sector in, the, in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, yes, I think we uh, will need to have uh, legislation uh, in Scotland, uh, in the Scottish Parliament. Of course, part of our uh, opposition to the withdrawal bill and the approach taken there is there will be limits on our ability to legislate in some of these areas, you know, something that is uh, hugely uh, frustrating. Uh, as you know, we've set out in the stability and simplicity consultation, which consultation responses have been analysed just now, and final proposals will be uh, published shortly. We have set out uh, some of our thoughts in terms of how from here through to 2022 we you know, have a situation where there is virtually no change uh, and then looking at a, a period of simplification uh, through to 2024. So we have set out what is probably the most um, detailed uh, plan anywhere in the UK of how we see that sort of transition uh, operating. Uh, frameworks will inevitably be required in some areas and there will be areas around agriculture where that is possible. Uh, we are not uh, agreeable to the UK agriculture bill that's currently going through the process. They are applying to Scotland for a variety of reasons that I'm happy uh, to go into with you if you want. Uh, I do believe that the position the Scottish Parliament should be in is when we've decided the right systems that we want to put in place with appropriate consultation and dialogue uh, with stakeholders, then that should be something the Scottish Parliament has responsibility for doing. Edward Mountain. 
thank you. I mean, I think on this, it, it's interesting. It's really a question of when the Agriculture Bill will, will be coming forward, because I think that uh, I think it's critical to agriculture in Scotland to have some clarity in the future direction. So I think if you could clarify to me on when, and, and also whether you believe the uh, indicative aggregate measure of support that's uh, been submitted by the UK government to the World Trade Organization will, in your mind, allow direct funding to agriculture in Scotland to continue. First Minister. Uh, well, I, I want to see um, our farmers uh, and uh, those in our food production sector uh, continue to be supported in the way uh, that they, they are, to the, the levels that they are. Clearly, as you uh, well know, there are a number of issues that we don't yet have clarity on in terms of uh, funding. You know, Scotland disproportionately uh, benefits through uh, cap funding at the moment, and we have no certainty from the UK government uh, if they ever manage to get a deal and get Brexit into operation and get all of these things working. We've got no clarity uh, beyond the end of this decade at what share of that funding they will uh, give to Scotland. So there are significant uncertainties there, um, and I think it's important that we continue as a parliament, not just as a government, to press the UK government uh, for that certainty uh, as early as we can possibly get it. I would take issue with your uh, view that we don't, uh, that the Scottish Government is not setting out as much clarity as, as we can. The simplicity, stability and simplicity consultation sets out very clearly what our approach to this will be um, and we will uh, continue to give more detail on that, firstly as we come forward with the final proposals after the consultation and then as we set out legislative steps. But the important things that we need to continue to press for are clarity around funding and you know, as much uh, policy autonomy here as possible and not allow ourselves to be boxed in uh, by having powers effectively taken away from us or constrained in the way we've seen happen in uh, the context of the withdrawal bill. Lewis MacDonald, Convener of Health and Sport, please. Thank you very much. First Minister, you talked in April about work you had commissioned on corporate governance in NHS sports and you may have seen the report on governance which was published by the Health and Sport Committee in July. Since then, a number of further issues have arisen around leadership in the NHS, with reports, for example, that as many as seven chief executives are either serving notice periods or have indicated an intention to retire, with boards large and small struggling to recruit to leadership roles uh, and with the well-publicised challenges some boards have faced in balancing the books. What conclusions have you reached? First Minister, about issues of leadership in the NHS and what do you think our health service may need to do differently in, the, in that area? First Minister. Okay, uh, there's a lot in that. In, in, first, in terms of uh, vacancies or uh, imminent vacancies in senior positions and health boards, there are recruitment processes underway and at different stages in all of these health boards. And I don't think we should see uh, the fact that, that people retire or people move on as somehow you know, inherently problematic. That's a, an issue. Uh, organisations have to deal with day in and day out. So, you know, all of the, the health boards where there are vacancies or are likely to be vacancies, these processes are already underway. Uh, in terms of your committee's report, which I uh, think was, it was wide ranging and it was very helpful and welcome looking at, at staff, clinical and corporate governance. Uh, you asked, uh, I think specifically about corporate governance, the uh, review of corporate governance that I think I spoke about the last time uh, I was before conveners, uh, which was carried out by John Brown and Susan Walsh is now complete. So the kind of things that we are uh, looking uh, at, 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 not looking at, are committed to doing to making sure that we have the, the quality and capacity in terms of leadership in the NHS uh, is uh, around uh, board uh, more generally. So making sure, for example, that non-executive members are supported to be uh, effective, more effective in the roles, that boards are more represented representative of the communities that they, they serve, that there is a more meaningful and genuine uh, engagement between boards uh, and uh, the communities that uh, they serve. Uh, so there's a range of work uh, across all of these headings uh, currently being taken forward. You uh, finally mentioned uh, some issues in specific health boards. I'm happy to go into any of those if, if you want. Uh, I guess uh, NHS Tayside may be one in particular that is in your mind, but uh, I, I can go into the detail of that if you want, but in the interest of time, I'll uh, end there and allow you to ask your supplementary. Thank you, Thank you very much, First Minister. I, I look forward, I, I welcome what you say about the conclusions drawn by the review led by John Brown. I'm very interested to see how they are applied, not just in Tayside, which obviously has particular problems, but, but across the board. Uh, uh, 
One of the things the Health and Sport Committee took evidence on and was, was concerned about was different perceptions of the role of strategic leadership at board level uh, operating within a framework set by, by national, national policy. I wonder if, if, if uh, you have a view on that. Do you believe that the balance is right between uh, local NHS leaders as leaders as opposed to, uh, as against their responsibility as part of the wider team? Or are there changes there that you think might be required um, as well? First Minister. I, I think the balance is broadly right, but we've always got to keep that under review and, and there will always be um, situations in individual health boards, as there will be in any organisations, where perhaps the balance in a particular organisation has not been right and needs to be rectified. And, you know, keep talking about NHS Tayside here, but obviously that's one of the issues that uh, has been uh, considered and is being uh, looked at there. Obviously, there are, uh, I was going to say tensions, I'm not sure that is the right word to use, but in terms of the relationship between government and senior leadership in health boards, they operate within a policy framework, but they then have the job of uh, delivering against that framework. And, and often, I'm sure, I, I'm not speaking for them, but I'm sure there will be... Uh, leaders in NHS boards at times who think you know they should have more autonomy to, to do that but equally government me as first minister the health secretary you know has parliament saying if there is a problem in a local health board that they have to intervene and do something about it so these things in a an area where there is understandably and very legitimate uh, strong political accountability, these balances are always going to be difficult to get right. Uh, I suppose the final thing I would mention here, which I think we did talk about the last time as well, is increasingly as in terms of the delivery of some services, boards are collaborating on a regional basis. Uh, there is you know, the, the need to make sure that there is still the accountability through individual health boards for services that are being delivered on that regional basis because health boards remain uh, the unit of accountability. I said the last time I'm not of the view that we should uh, start to undertake large-scale structural uh, change in the health service simply because it diverts attention from the delivery of frontline services. Thank you. Bill Kidd, Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments, please, Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, First Minister, a key part of the SPPA committee's remit is in the names, procedures, uh, and it's considering how parliamentary procedures support the parliament and its committees in fulfilling their scrutiny role effectively. So given the challenges, and you'll have answered quite a few of these points already, but it wouldn't do any harm, I think, actually, just to go over some of them. How will the government seek to collaborate with parliament and its committees? in particular, to ensure that they have the information that they need in order to plan and undertake parliamentary scrutiny in the context of additional demands that will result from Brexit. First Minister. Well, this is a very live issue. I think it is uh, most acute at the moment in terms of the planning for and management of the pipeline of uh, secondary legislation that will require uh, either to be consented uh, to by the Scottish Parliament or Scottish SSIs that will have to come forward. The Minister for Parliamentary Business, I, I think, has already written to all conveners to give our latest estimate of what the, the volume and likely time scales of that work will be, although I should say it's very fluid because you know, we are dependent on uh, UK government approaches as a significant interdependency between what we do and the approach the UK government's taken and of course there's still a lot of uncertainty about what it actually is that we're preparing for. Um, I think this information has already been shared uh, with uh, conveners but our current estimate is at, at UK level there's likely to be about 800 to 1,000 uh, regulations needed uh, to prepare for uh, exit. Um, in the Scottish Parliament uh, we estimate at the moment that around 140 to 160 UK government statutory instruments will require, uh, will have devolved prov provision in them and will require uh, Scottish Government uh, to uh, give notice to the Parliament uh, that we intend to consent to those. Uh, that process is already underway. There's a number of notifications already been made. Uh, and in addition to that, we reckon there'll be about 50 Scottish SSIs uh, that will have to be laid in the Scottish Parliament. We're not Yet we haven't yet laid any of those. It's likely that those will be delayed, uh, laid in December and January. So it's a significant additional volume of work for the Parliament. Uh, we uh, are you know, relying on 
information and also the state of uh, these preparations at UK level to take some of the decisions we've got to take and then it's incumbent on us to make sure the Parliament is kept fully up to speed, which we are undertaking to do. I think Graham Day has given a commitment to update committee conveners on a monthly basis of the, the changes that may arise in those estimates. Bill Kidd. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that, First Minister. Can I ask um, how much uh, collaboration um, is being undertaken by Westminster in the knowledge of the amount of work which is going to have to be absorbed um, through, S, uh, through SIs and SSIs here in the Parliament? How much um, help is being given by UK departments in order to ensure that this um, volume of work will be uh, able to be undertaken by the numbers of people who we have here in the Scottish Parliament, both in committees and in government? First Minister. I think it would be fair to say that is uh, variable, um, depending on the, the UK government department we're talking about. We're working uh, as hard as we can to try to uh, get as much information as early as possible and to get as much involvement as early as possible in the drafting and development of SSIs so that we can take decisions as quickly as we can about whether uh, we want to uh, ask the Parliament to consent to UK SSIs uh, for their devolved content or whether we think that there is enough policy divergence that means that we have to lay SSIs here. That's variable. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm telling anybody anything they don't know here when I say that we're dealing with a Whitehall machine just now that is utterly overloaded by the nightmare that is Brexit. And so, you know, while I'm always uh, prepared to countenance that some of the difficulties we find in uh, getting information and engaging properly is, is deliberate, some of it is just there is a, a Whitehall machine that is utterly overloaded. Um, so it's, it's difficult for us. It's not an easy process. We're trying to manage our way through it as well as we possibly can uh, so that we can then help Parliament manage its way through it as best we possibly can. But it's not a situation we want to be in. Uh, and from a Scottish Government perspective, there is uh, an awful lot of civil service time just now that I would rather was being spent on other things that is being consumed by uh, this kind of... Uh, work, but also looking at contingency planning around possible no deal scenario. Uh, and, you know, frankly, that is all time that could and should be getting spent on more productive matters. Bob Doris, Convener of Social Security. Thanks, please. President Officer. First Minister, there are proposals for some in work claimants of universal credit to face conditionality or rather sanction by the DWP if they fail to increase their rates of pay or hours of work. One witness told our committee inquiry into this, the idea that, that it is the sole responsibility of the claimant to increase their hours or earnings to satisfy the universal credit system bears no relation to reality. Given that tackling low pay and boosting employment opportunities are also Scottish Government priorities, how will the Scottish Government seek to support this group of claimants to avoid potential sanction by the DWP? And has there been any formal communication between the Scottish Government and the DWP regarding designing a fairer system that might actually have a bearing on reality? First Minister. Uh, well, to come to the uh, last part of your question, first, there's uh, lots of communications between the Scottish Government and the D DWP on a range of issues, and uh, that includes universal credit. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to, it probably has in some shape or form been provided to your committee, but if it hasn't, we can make that available. Uh, much of that will be us uh, outlining our deep and growing concerns about universal credit and asking for universal credit to be halted. It is an unfolding disaster, and it's an unfolding disaster that is bringing and will continue to bring misery to an awful lot of individuals and families across the country. And, you know, there have been some suggestions in recent days that the, the UK government will agree to pause the rollout of it. I don't know whether there are any substance to those suggestions, but I certainly hope that there are, because I'm deeply concerned uh, about the impact that universal credit is having. On the issue about sanctions and conditionality, I, you know, I take the view that sanctions and conditionality, as well as often in the way that those things are applied uh, are very morally uh, dubious. They're not effective, and there's evidence that these approaches are not effective, particularly when the things that claimants are being expected to do are, are not things within their control. It's not within the control of a claimant to suddenly necessarily increase the hours they work for a company or increase the rate of pay that they have. So these are uh, aspects of 
universal credit, but the benefit system more generally, that unfairly penalise people who have already struggle most. In terms of what we are doing around low, work, uh, low uh, pay and fair work, we've got a range, and you will be familiar with much of this, we've got a range of different strands of work. Uh, our work to increase the number of Scottish workers who are paid the real living wage, we have a higher percentage already than other parts of the UK, but we've still got work to do to increase that. The uh, work we're doing and now intensifying around fair work and the greater conditionality we intend to apply in terms of uh, companies who are accessing contracts or government grants to make sure that they are paying their workers fairly and not you know, having exploitative zero-hours contracts, for example. Uh, the new system we've put in place around employability support, the uh, scheme that will come into force next year around uh, employment support for parents looking to get back into work. So there's a whole range of ways in which we're trying to get people into work, help to ensure that they're in secure work and that they're paid a decent wage for it, and we will continue to do that. The more power we accrue, and hopefully we will over uh, a period around uh, the social security system, the more we can help to make sure that all of that is joined up and works as a coherent system. Bob Doris. OK, um, thank you for that answer. First Minister, our committee has also heard deeply worrying concerns that transitional protections promised for existing tax credit claimants from potential benefit cuts when transferred over to universal credit could be lost, for example, if a woman flees an abusive relationship. Given the Scottish Government has a variety of policies regarding ending violence against women and girls, can I ask the Scottish Government's position on this matter and will you make that position clear to the UK Government? First Minister. Our, our position is one of deep and growing concern about this aspect as well as uh, other aspects and yes, we will continue to make our views very known to the UK Government. We don't right now know what the final arrangements are going to be for transitional protection uh, in universal credit. Uh, we've responded to the Social Security Advisory Committee's consultation on the draft regulations, uh, and I think we've shared that response with your committee. Uh, we've got real concerns about the process for migration and transition in particular, uh, and I think the draft regulations frankly raise more questions than they give answers. Uh, but until we see the outcome of uh, the consultation and the DWP response, we're not going to know the, the full impact of transitional protection. Uh, we do know that it's going to be eroded. One of the things that particularly concerns us is that the plans for managed migration will require people, even if they're already on benefits, to make a claim for universal credit. So you'll have people who may have been on uh, benefits for a significant period of time who suddenly find themselves having to claim afresh and then have the waiting period before they uh, get the help that they're entitled to, which, you know, as we know from areas where there's been rollout, will significantly increase rent arrears and drive people into debt. So, you know, I can't really, I honestly can't um, stress strongly enough how concerned uh, I am about universal credit, as we both represent Glasgow constituencies. Glasgow's, you know, obviously uh, about to go through the full rollout, and you know the, the impact of this on already vulnerable people is going to be severe. And I think the sooner this uh, whole system gets stopped in its tracks, the better. Claire Adamson, can be in education and skills, please. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, both personally and as a government, there's been a, a commitment um, to education, particularly in the area of tackling the poverty-related attainment gap through the Attainment Challenge and other projects. Could I, you just give us an idea, First Minister, of what success would look like in this area? First Minister. Well, first I'll take the opportunity to restate uh, my commitment to reducing the attainment gap in schools and uh, much of what we're doing around education just now has that aim uh, firmly in mind. In terms of what success looks like, what, one of the conclusions we came to early on in, in consultation with a range of different stakeholders is that there's no single measure around attainment that can adequately capture progress that's been made. So the uh, 2018 uh, National Improvement Framework, as uh, you will know, uh, set a, a number of uh, measures that will be looked at. Uh, there's 11 measures in total that cover literacy, numeracy and health and wellbeing at every stage of a child's development. Um, and that's intended then to provide us with a, a rounded 
view of the attainment gap and then also allow us to measure the progress that we're making uh, in closing that gap. Uh, Deputy First Minister uh, has tasked Education Scotland uh, to working with Audit Scotland to implement a programme of inspections and report on the progress that's being made on that, uh, because it's important both that government has a clear sight of that, but parliament and the wider public also has the ability through those different measures to hold government to account. Claire Adams. Uh, First Minister, the um, particular pay pupil equity funding that um, is, is in the control of the head teachers. What mechanisms do the government have to ensure that the projects that are out there under pupil equity funding are appropriate, that they're not backfilling what should be core funded project areas, and probably most importantly, that best practice and success are identified and shared? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, the projects that have been funded through the pupil equity fund should not be replacing or backfilling things that are already happening and we've taken a pretty robust uh, approach to that and will continue to take a robust approach. PEF is intended to be additional um, and you know that is absolutely the principle of it that we will strongly uh, adhere to. In terms of appropriateness, this, this I think is a more difficult issue because uh, the the philosophy behind PEF is not just to provide additional resources, but it's to provide those resources to head teachers for them to decide the allocation of in a way that they judge will be uh, best placed to help close the attainment gap. So I think we've got to be careful that we don't start making you know, snap judgments on whether a particular head teacher is using resources appropriately or not. I mean, I've seen some examples of the use of PEF money that uh, I know will probably raise eyebrow, you know, I think I shared this uh, particular anecdote during a session of First Minister's Questions, a school that I visited where some of the money had been used to take children and parents on a, a sort of weekend away. And, you know, people may look at that and say, is that appropriate? But the head teacher's view was that it was getting parents who previously had been quite distant from the school, more engaged with the school, which then helps ensure a greater attendance. So he could make an absolutely solid case why he thought that would have the impact. So we've got to be careful about not trying to uh, impose a uniformity or a, a sort of central uh, interpretation of appropriateness on a scheme that's not intended to work that way. That said, just briefly, the, the pupil equity uh, funding will be assessed as part of the overall evaluation of the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Uh, I mentioned the work that Education Scotland and Audit Scotland are doing that will also look at how uh, PEF is used across schools as part of that programme of inspections. And attainment advisors, which of course have been appointed uh, to help with this work, are looking at a sample of school level improvement plans uh, to see how PEF is being used across schools. And we'll then we will try to, to spread some of that best practice so that teachers do have examples to look at as to how they might use that funding but it's important to say that the the key decision maker in the use of PEF should continue to be the head teacher. Thank you. Gillian Martin, convener of Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, please. Thank you, Deputy President, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, the recently published Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change special report highlights that we need even greater urgency on climate change. And I'm interested to know your thoughts on how we respond as a country to that. Do you um, agree that the level of ambition in the climate change, Scotland Bill must respond to this latest report and, and match what science is telling us is now required in the next decade rather than what to date has been considered feasible. First Minister. Um, well, Scotland's performance around reducing emissions and tackling climate change uh, thus far has been genuinely world leading and that is globally recognised. So our emissions have almost halved uh, already since uh, 1990 levels. We've met our last three annual targets. We're on track to meet the increased 2020 target. We're outperforming the UK and I think across the EU only Sweden uh, performs better than Scotland. So I think that's a, a track record to be proud of. In terms of the bill that's being introduced, um, I know there is a view that we should... Well, let me just focus firstly on what that bill does. The IPCC report, which I'll come back to in a second, the central recommendation in the IPCC report is that the world should become carbon neutral by 2050. 
The bill as drafted delivers that for Scotland. So the 90% reduction in overall emissions delivers carbon uh, neutrality by 2050. Uh, so I think it's important to recognise that the bill in its current form delivers on that central recommendation of the IPCC report. It's also uh, the bill in its current form is recognised as being uh, an important contribution to implementing the Paris Agreement. I, I got a letter earlier this year from the uh, Lauren Fabius, the architect of the Paris Agreement, that described our bill as a concrete application of the Paris Agreement. So I think we should first of all just recognise what the bill does. Yes, there are views, a lot of views, that we should up that ambition to make the 90% 100% uh, by 2050. Uh, we want to get to 100% as quickly as possible, so I share that ambition. Uh, but we've got to be able to uh, look people in the eye and tell them we've got a plan to deliver. And uh, we take our advice from the UK Committee on Climate Change. Its most recent advice tells us that at this stage, 90% is at the limit of feasibility. Uh, we've asked, uh, Rosanna Cunningham has asked the uh, Committee on Climate Change in light of the IPCC report to update its advice to the Scottish Government and we want that updated advice to be available to the Parliament before we pass the bill. If it says we can up those targets, we will. But, and this is my final point, but it's an important point about the bill as drafted. Even if it doesn't, the bill as drafted puts obligations on us to regularly review targets so that as soon as it is feasible, we are moving to the 100% uh, Emission, emission reduction target overall, because I want to get us there as quickly as possible. Uh, but given that we have annual targets to meet, this is not a faraway target that we can just set now and hope we can meet it. We are held to account through annual targets, so we also have to have a clear plan about how we get there. Gillian Martin. Thanks for, for that comprehensive answer. I mean, the, um, EU innovation funds that might drive breakthrough technology in this area um, I mean, how confident are you that the UK government will replace those funding streams post-Brexit and, and reinvest in technologies that we've already identified that we need to meet our targets? For example, carbon capture and storage. And carbon capture and storage was mentioned, the First Minister might be aware, by Lord Deben yesterday when he gave evidence has been an absolute must-have. But as the First Minister will know, that, that projects there that, that looked like Scotland was going to be a world leader in that were cut. First Minister. Indeed, and uh, obviously close to, to home for uh, you, and that's hugely frustrating for us, and we continue to uh, try to work with the UK government to make progress around uh, carbon capture and storage, and there is some work uh, in, in terms of pilot projects uh, underway um, at the moment. So we absolutely want to see investment in the technology that will allow us to move further and faster around uh, reducing emissions. Yes, that does require uh, the UK government to give us clarity around replacement of EU funding streams and also their own intentions, because this is an area of responsibility that is split between the Scottish government and the UK government. And also, you know, because of you know the UK-wide or GB-wide nature of uh, the grid, for example, we need to work together in order to be able to deliver as, as quickly as possible. So we will continue to try to get that collaborative working, because uh, not just in a UK sense, but across Europe as well, we will get further and faster here, uh, given the nature of the issue we're dealing with, if all countries are working together in a collaborative way, which is why the Paris Agreement is so important and why the uh, COP conferences, another one coming up in December, are so important to try to make sure there is that international collaboration. Joanne Lamont, Convene Republic Petitions, please. Great. Thank you very much, Convener. I think, as I've said in the past, the Public Petitions Committee is an interesting oversight of what matters to people as a whole range of issues that we deal with. But I want particularly to focus on um, one area that um, we've had a number of petitions to the Public Petition Committee on, which is about the support available to young people in relation to their mental health. Um, and indeed, the committee is going to be doing an investigation into the appropriateness of the, the support that might be available to young people. And I wonder if you can just simply um, outline um, how you're ensuring that the appropriate support is available to young people at the point when they need it? First Minister. Well, I think in Scotland and in many other countries, so I don't think Scotland is unique here, uh, we, we, I think it would be wrong to start from the premise that we can say with confidence that support is always available to young people uh, coming forward for mental health support uh, in the right places at the right time. We see uh, 
uh, uh, reducing stigma around mental health, which I think all of us welcome. So young people, all people of all ages, feel more able to come forward for help. Uh, we have uh, pressure on our specialist CAMS service, uh, which we're working to uh, both reduce the pressure but also make sure the CAMS uh, system is able to cope with that. But part of what we need to do, and I set out some of uh, the plans that we are taking forward in the programme for government, so what we're trying to do is uh, shift a lot of the the, the, the balance here much more into preventative uh, care and into communities. So the key uh, proposals in the programme for government were around increasing uh, the number of councillors in schools uh, and in colleges and universities to make sure that there is a greater focus on mental wellbeing rather than just treating mental ill health and that that's available for young people where they are rather than them having to access it elsewhere. We're also investing in the creation of a a community wellbeing service for uh, people in the 5 to 24 age group, uh, which again we set out uh, some of the detail and funding of that in the, the programme for government. Uh, so there's no doubt we need to invest more in mental health, but we also need to you know, radically transform how and where young people access uh, the support that they need, and that's what we are trying to do. And if we do that, then we also ensure that the specialist service, which will always be very important, is there for the people who actually need specialist care, rather than, as sometimes happens at the moment, people who should and uh, would be better accessing care in the community because that's not available for them, end up accessing specialist CAMs, and that puts more pressure on the system, and everybody ends up getting a, a service that's not of the, the standard that they should get. So this is a big programme of work for the government, which the Mental Health Minister obviously is leading, and we I certainly look forward to your committee's uh, inquiry and ultimate report into this, which I'm sure will be helpful. Joanne Lamont. I suppose... Um, I think that's a very helpful response, but I wondered what support is available to GPs? Quite often that will be a first port of call for a young person to ensure that they are signpost appropriately rather than the number of times they may prescribe, but in fact there should be other um, approaches taken, first of all. And secondly, again, along the lines you say there would be counsellors and college and schools and so on, how do we raise awareness amongst those people who are around young people how, how do we increase their awareness of how you should respond to somebody who may simply be looking for help, feeling anxious, stressed, so that they get the appropriate, um, you get direct to the appropriate place? So how do we, I suppose, as a society, become more educated in how we respond to young people who are looking for a response? So it's not either you're in a crisis or there's nothing that we can do. First Minister. But in terms of the, the different components of that question, the GP one, I mean, there'll be... Obviously, it's important that there is the right clinical advice being given to GPs. I'm happy to have uh, health officials provide your committee with some detail of what advice and support is there for GPs just now, which might help to inform uh, the focus of that aspect of your inquiry. Uh, but often, the first port of call for people will be GPs. Part of the wider uh, transformation of primary care we're doing now, of course, is to make sure that in health centres and GP practices, there are different health professionals there so that people uh, don't always have to see a GP. They're actually uh, getting to the right uh, person and that also helps reduce some of the pressures that GPs are working under. In terms of uh, the second bit of your question about the people around young people, I should have mentioned in my first answer part of the programme for work uh, programme for government work we're taking forward uh, includes teacher training, uh, because of often teachers will be the, the key point uh, of contact for young people outside of their, their own homes and families, and so that's an important part. But lastly, the wider societal point, I think, is is important, and I think that is already underway. I think we are all much more... Uh, literate about mental health than we were previously. I think uh, across uh, society that's the case. I think a lot of the charities and third sector organisations working in mental health have done and will continue to have a big role to play in helping to make sure that that continues. Uh, but making sure that mental health awareness is not just something that mental health professionals have, but whether it's teachers, police officers, uh, people in our prisons, uh, other people working in uh, GP surgeries, for example, uh, that they all have that mental health awareness is an ongoing uh, challenge, but one that I think is underway and will continue to accelerate. Thank you. And I call Gordon Linters, Community Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. Mr Linters, please. Good afternoon, First Minister. 
Um, the, the programme for government says the Scottish Government will introduce fair work criteria through regional selective assistance and other large Scottish enterprise job-related grants. Now, this can only happen with a change in approach by Scottish enterprise. So my question is, how is the Scottish Government intending to achieve this change in our approach? And does it agree with Scottish enterprise that in dealing with Scottish enterprises, perhaps, and also businesses, that uh, positive influence rather than a, a directive or a directional approach is appropriate? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I, I think... I will stand to be corrected if I'm wrong here, because I may well be, but I, I think from memory the programme for government on the RSA point actually recognises that it's Scottish enterprise uh, that is in the lead here. So it's Scottish enterprise that's currently looking at how it will introduce uh, this element of conditionality in the future to RSA grants. And uh, in terms of that uh, specific uh, issue, but also the wider uh, change of approach that we recently announced around uh, what we were calling the fair work first approach. We'll set out more details of that in due course because what we intend to do over the rest of this parliament is apply the same approach to as many uh, government uh, grant streams as we possibly can and also look to embed that even more firmly uh, than it already is in the public procurement uh, system. And it, it comes from a, a, a fairly basic principle. If, if companies, as we want them to, benefit from taxpayers' money, then we want to encourage companies uh, to uh, also act in a way that benefits the overall economy and the living standards of the people who, who work for them, for them. And of course, all the evidence now says that companies that are much more inclusive and engage their workers, pay a decent wage, etc., uh, tend to, to do better. I think the so sort the of end bit of your question there was about the, the balance that we always have to think about how to strike is between, for uh, want of a better expression, carrot and stick in these approaches. You know, the business pledge that we introduced, uh, the approach we take around the living wage accreditation campaign is all based, and I think rightly based, on encouraging businesses to do the right thing because it's the right thing, but also because it's good for their own businesses. But when we are uh, applying significant sums of public money, I think it's also right that we look at where we can use that uh, perhaps a bit in, in a bit more of a, a directive way too, and that's a balance that we will always try to keep under review and get right. Gordon and Hurst. Um, you, you mentioned public money there, and another um, item in the Scottish Programme for Government was the publicly owned energy company, although I don't think detail was given there, because that's something to be looked at as we move forward. Um, has the Scottish Government considered the examples of some of the companies that are already in existence, such as Bristol Energy, which has posted losses in the millions, and in particular, how will the Scottish Government ensure uh, best value for the taxpayer when it comes to the publicly owned energy company? that it's proposing or looking to um, introduce? First Minister. Well, we're looking at all sorts of different models. We're, we're not intended to replicate the, the kind of uh, experience that you've just uh, highlighted there. You'll be glad uh, to know. In terms of the... I, I know your, your committee's uh, looking at this just now, and let me say I think the, the work your committee is doing uh, will, have, uh, will be very useful in terms of the government taking forward its own thinking and work around this. We published, I think from memory, in April of this year our initial report looking at some of the options. Uh, we are now in the process of commissioning an outline business case we'll, which will look at some of the uh, detailed options for a public energy company. We think sensibly, I think, that this will be something that will be taken forward in a phased uh, basis. We've also asked COSLA to uh, play into uh, this work in terms of uh, how uh, they can be part of, of putting uh, this together. So it's work that is, well, there's a lot of work being done. It's still in terms of the, the decisions at a reasonably early stage, and we are obviously wanting to make sure that your committee has the opportunity to feed into to that work as well. So it'll be one that we keep in close contact with your committee about as it develops. Thank you. Can I explain that Margaret Mitchell, Convener of Justice, is unavoidably unable to attend, and she's authorised me, brave woman, to ask questions on behalf of the Justice Committee, so it's like old times. So here's the questions for the Justice Committee. The evidence the Justice Committee and its subcommittee have taken as part of their pre-budget -pre scrutiny and during the year points to a number of substantial additional costs to that portfolio. While she realises you'll not be able to give full details now, First Minister, would you outline what priority you 
place on the justice portfolio and matters such as increased support for victims and issues such as domestic violence. In particular, will you commit to increasing funding in the justice portfolio, which has seen funding fall from just over $3 billion in 2014-15 to $2.856 billion in real terms in this financial year? Well, I'm tempted to say the budget will be published on the 12th of December. Obviously, I can't go into uh, decisions uh, that will rightly be taken in the course of our budget consideration over the next uh, few weeks and obviously some of those decisions not all of them but some of them depend on what comes from the, the Chancellor's budget uh, on Monday of next week. In terms of the, the justice portfolio I think we have given uh, significant priority to the justice portfolio overall and particular priorities that sit within that so for example we've already given a commitment to protect the police revenue budget in real terms uh, for the remainder of this parliament which is important in allowing uh, the uh, Scottish Police Authority to take decisions to make sure policing is on a, a strong footing. Part of that, of course, was the pay deal that we announced in the last few weeks for police officers. Uh, in terms of domestic violence, and again in the programme for government, uh, I announced additional investment, which will be reflected in the budget uh, to speed up access to support for uh, victims of rape and sexual assault, because you know, domestic tackling domestic abuse and sexual assault is a, a key priority for us, and we know that you know, whether it's Rape Crisis Scotland or the other organisations working in this field have uh, struggled with the backlog of, of cases, so we want to help them uh, speed up access uh, to uh, services. So there's a whole range of uh, areas where I think we are already demonstrating through the budget decisions we're taking, our commitment in these areas. But I'm sure the Justice Committee will give uh, close and careful scrutiny to the budget when it's published in December. Thank you. The supplementary is that the Chief Constable uh, has SPA authority support for an outline business case for a new vital IT project, costing nearly £300 million to support frontline officers doing their job. If the funding is not provided, the project will be delayed and phased. To do nothing will cost nearly £90 million anyway. What assurances can you provide, First Minister, that additional sums of money out with existing budget lines in the justice portfolio will be found? Well, you know, I, you can say about anything that if the money's not provided for it, it won't happen. I mean, that's kind of an obvious point to make in any area of uh, budgeting and, and government policy. Uh, our job through the, the resources we make available to the police is to support the police uh, deliver their objectives. Uh, the work that uh, the convener has referred to there around uh, the, the IT programme uh, is important work. We've got to make sure our police officers are supported with the best available IT, both in terms of uh, the, their own equipment, but also the IT that underpins and supports the police service more generally. So that's important work that will be fully factored into the decisions we take around uh, budgeting. But I'm not going to, and I, I can't, and, and wouldn't go into the detail of what those budget decisions will be today, because obviously that is for the Finance Secretary to set out in the budget in a few weeks' time. Yes, but rightly, I think she's put down markers, and I'm just the messenger. Um, now, I've got some time in hand if somebody wants, if any convener wants to field a question they want to carry up on. Yes, Bruce Crawford. Uh, First Minister, I think I got it right when you said that you thought that the most likely outcome of the Brexit negotiations was now a no deal. Um, and therefore, I think it would be useful to hear from you about what you think the, consequence, the political consequences of such a scenario will be and what the impact will be on the people of Scotland? Well, let me, I suppose, repeat what I say, but give the context. I think as of today, the most likely outcome, as I look at it, is increasingly uh, the, the EU and the UK being unable to conclude a withdrawal agreement. Um, because when you look at the issues that they're still trying to resolve, they are, the, the differences between them are fundamental. And, and two years, two and a half years have now passed and those issues haven't been resolved and it's hard to see, particularly since every statement that the Prime Minister makes just now, and it's entirely up to her what are, is in her statements, she seems to reduce her room for negotiation rather than open up room for negotiation. And of course, commitments that were given in December around the Northern Irish backstop are being rolled back from. So it's very difficult to see uh, how all of these pieces now come together. Now, you know, who knows? Tomorrow that may look different. Next week it may look different. So, but as of now, I find it hard to see how 
we get to a position in a matter of weeks where a withdrawal agreement with the Northern Irish issue in particular resolved uh, how we get there. Now, if that happens, if, if there is a failure to reach a deal what I don't think we can simply accept is that that means the UK careers out of the EU and off that cliff edge next March, regardless of that. At that point, in my view, the House of Commons has to assert itself. There are alternatives here. All of the problems that are currently uh, being encountered uh, in the withdrawal agreement negotiations would be resolved at a stroke if the UK decided to stay in the single market and the customs union. Uh, and you know that, in my view, remains, while I'm not saying it would be easy, looking at it objectively. It's the only option that I think has any chance of commanding a majority in the House of, of Commons. Requesting the extension to Article 50, I think, would have to be another uh, option that the House of Commons looked at. Of course, we've got the uh, court case that started in the court session here that's currently with the ECJ about whether the UK can unilaterally uh, revoke Article 50, and that may add a an extra dynamic when we get the, the outcome of that court case. So I don't think we can get ourselves into a situation either if there is a withdrawal agreement cobbled together that the House of Commons just has to accept it, however bad it is, because the only uh, alternative is no deal. I don't think that fa fire or frying pan choice should be accepted by the Commons. And if there's no withdrawal agreement, then the Commons presumably has to assert itself and get us into a better position where um, it's requesting the extension of Article 50 to allow the common sense uh, approach if we're leaving the EU, which is single market and customs union, to come back on the table. Joe McAlpine. Yes, thank you very much. Um, First Minister, also as a supplementary to um, Bruce Crawford's question on, on no deal, uh, the UK government has published, I think it's over 100 technical papers now, um, on the consequences for no deal across different sectors. But one area that they haven't published a paper on is what happens to EU citizens uh, in the event of no deal. And I know that the Prime Minister was asked about this on Monday and she's given verbal assurances about that. But I'm aware in my committee that the European Parliament doesn't even have any, any confidence uh, that the, the, the deal that's on the table at the moment, a negotiated deal, would put the right guarantees in place for EU citizens because the European Parliament doesn't trust the UK government to stand by any uh, commitments it makes to EU citizens. So I just wondered what you thought of, um, of this, the fact that there hasn't been anything uh, outlined uh, as to what will happen to EU citizens in the event of no deal? And do you have confidence in the Prime Minister's reassurances in that? First Minister. Well, I think it's shameful um, to you know, be blunt about it. There's many shameful, deeply regrettable aspects of the whole Brexit fiasco, but probably the most shameful is the way EU citizens living here and British citizens living in other EU countries have been left to wonder what the future holds. They should have been given categoric cast iron assurances on day one, the day after the referendum. They should have been told, no matter what else happens, uh, your future and your status here is secured. And the fact that two and a half years on, that's still not the case is utterly shameful um, in my view and I we will all have constituents who you know are left just now thinking well we hope it will be okay but we still don't know for sure and we don't know for sure even if we get to see what the arrangements will be around families coming to visit us and all of that and it is you know it's unconscionable that people uh, are in that position when their lives effectively are, are uh, aspects of their life uh, are on hold as a result. Um, do I have confidence? Well, I'm not Saying that I, you know, I, I want to, to say that I, I don't take in good faith what the Prime Minister is saying, but I don't think anybody can have confidence that verbal assurances will turn out uh, to be adhered to. We've got a situation, which I've just been alluding to with Bruce Crawford, where the UK government signed up to the Northern Irish backstop in December, and we now have ministers like Michael Gove, ex-ministers like Boris Johnson, who sat around the cabinet table when they signed it, now pretending that they didn't know what they were signing, and the whole uh, UK government, including the Prime Minister, trying to back away from it. Now, if they're doing that on you know, things that are there in black and white that they signed up to, why should any EU citizen think that verbal assurances are worth anything? So it's a pretty sorry state of affairs. Um, and you know, I feel desperately sorry for EU citizens. For my part and for part of the Scottish Government, all we can continue to do is take every opportunity to tell every EU citizen living here that we, they're welcome, we want them here, this is their home, we want them to stay, and we'll do everything we can on a practical basis, whether 
that's what we've done around tuition fees for students or our commitment to pay the settled status fees of those working in devolved public services, we will do everything we can to give them the certainty that they should have had a long time ago and it's uh, so awful that they don't have yet. Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, ju just on a point that you made about a reference to the ECJ, um, I think the Court of Session has been asked to refer the matter to the Supreme Court rather than it going to the ECJ. So do you accept that's a matter for the, the Supreme Court if it does come before it on the Advocate General's reference to decide and not the ECJ? I, I stand corrected if that's the case. The, the point I was making is there is a court case currently winding its way through the courts that may have an impact on this issue of the extension or revocation of Article 50. I love the exchange between lawyers there, which I, I enjoyed. Um, I He's been a lawyer more recently than I have. So. It, yes, well... well don't underestimate yourself. <laughs> there are, I'm sure you don't. Um, are there any other questions? There aren't. So do you want to say anything finally, uh, First Minister? Have we covered, no, covered I'm, a great I'm, deal? I think we've covered a few, fair few issues today. So thank you, as always, for your time. Well, thank you very much, First Minister. I always find these much more interesting than First Minister's questions because we get lengthier answers uh, in exchange. And I thank all the conveners for their questions. And can I remind you, we've agreed biannual meetings with the First Minister, and the next meeting will be in April. Thank you very much, and I close this meeting.